previously on dry powder. We found we were able to generate superior returns, but with lower levels of volatility. Nick Humphreys, executive chairman of HG, described how deep sector expertise can pay dividends for a private equity firm. Today on the show, we'll see how HG applies its tech expertise in-house as the firm incorporates advanced analytics, AI, and machine learning into just about every facet of their investment strategy. We think it's absolutely the heart of the next generation of DD, of operation improvement in portfolio companies, generating higher revenues, etc. And we've invested hugely in it. I'm Hugh MacArthur, head of Bain's global private equity practice, and this is Dry Powder. Nick, I'd like to talk about how you use data and advanced analytics to help make better decisions across your deal pipeline in terms of sourcing, evaluating what you're excited about. How are you using these tools and technologies to actually get deals done yourselves? Uh, the, the very short answer is extensively. I think it's one of the kind of key features of this podcast. You talk about this a lot, and I think it's it's what attracted me initially to kind of listen to it. I found it fascinating that I hear the different ways in which people are kind of applying data and AI, ML and advanced analytics. We think it's absolutely the heart of DD, of operation improvement in portfolio companies, of generating higher revenues, et cetera. And we've invested hugely in it. So we have approximately kind of 40 people full-time working with us on these kind of things within our kind of portfolio operations group, which is a large investment for a firm of about 250 people. But we've seen evidence across the last seven or eight years of it helping us on diligence, on essentially engaging with portfolio companies to understand their customer base, of predicting where they can kind of get greater kind of sales and marketing leverage. So we're huge, huge believers based on evidence of of what we've been able to prove. And as I say, we're making very, very big investments in, in that area, which again, we're kind of fortunate that our scale in a kind of concentrated area enables us to make those kind of investments in our team. And these 40 people that you mentioned, Nick, are these data scientists? Uh, are they people that curate an ecosystem of partners and providers of tools and data that you use? Is it a mix? What does what, what a cross-section of these 40 folks look like? Uh, for us, it's, it's led by data scientists that are people that work full-time for us. And then they've essentially developed, you know, a series of kind of tools that we use, obviously algorithms, uh, ways in which we can kind of ingest data, cleanse data. So it's kind of consistent with how we want to analyze customer bases and those kind of things. And it's comparable to, you know, the last 30 or 40 or 50 types of that data we ingested from different companies. So over time, we've got, you know, terabytes of data across cycles across different companies in different kind of sectors and we start to get our insight from that data that we've ingested that allow us to kind of present that back to portfolio team management to enable them to understand it and make decisions on the back of that data so essentially it's all all of the above to be honest with you it's investment in all those areas mm-hmm. and so and these tools actually help CEOs and management teams do everything from evaluate their sales effectiveness, ways to gain market share, value proposition, reduce customer churn, all of these kinds of operating metrics? Yeah. So the the last one you picked, for example, is, you know, churn prediction. So are you able to kind of look at the indicators that would suggest you have a potential kind of customer churn event? And are you able to spot that three or six months prior to when the kind of notice of customer churn might come in from the customer and therefore, you know, dedicate a save team to that kind of customer in order to kind of head off that problem, whether that may be identifying there's a customer support issue, maybe there's been a billing issue, maybe there's been a kind of competitive threat that we've not responded to. So yeah, churn prediction and analytics around that will be again a classic case in point. Another might be by analyzing potential for kind of upsell or cross-sell And, you know, using customer data to predict where the most likely kind of hotspots for better qualified leads is going to come from from the customer base, which obviously then is trying to obviously increase that particular type of new win opportunity and ultimately obviously derive greater revenue growth in the business. 
At Bain, we're introducing, as, as we're grappling with advanced analytics ourselves and expanding our teams of data scientists and curating an ecosystem of providers of tools and data, we're coming up with new tools all the time, uh, some replacing older ones, some newer ones that have simply appeared in the marketplace. And, and I, I know that whenever we introduce to our team of partners and folks new tools, uh, you get a group of folks that are uh, early adopters and very excited about it throughout the organization. And then you get some groaning and eye rolling by some people saying, not another tool or data set that I need to learn to use how to apply. And so how do you actually get the organization at HG to swiftly adopt the new tools and data sets that people are, are backing when there's just so much out there, it can seem like a wave of noise coming at you? Uh, to, to be honest with you, Hugh, we've been pretty fortunate so far, as always early adopters. But what we found is that the tools, they've been so beneficial to deal teams, to investment executives, that it's not been a problem to get to try and encourage people to use them. You know, people see their contemporaries and their peers being successful when they are early adopters and mass majority tends to move pretty fast to, to adopt these things. What I think is important, as you said, is that, you know, this is not something that is solely the kind of jurisdiction of the data science team or the 40 people I talked about, you know, what's really important is that everybody within you know, the entirety of HG, all 250 people actually feel positive about these things. You know, it becomes part of their day job to understand these tools and to enhance their own kind of understanding. So we've really tried very hard from day one to mean that, you know, this is not some kind of like unique group that sits off in a corner you know, our data team are an integral part of our business. They clearly lead the field for us and take us into new areas. But we try and kind of cascade that adoption across, you know, the deal executives and the deal teams as fast as we possibly can and make people understand that this is a kind of core part of their tool set. It's not something that's just a specialized thing that sits in a corner. I think that integration is absolutely crucial between the data scientists and the rest of the team, because what we've at least discovered is that the data scientists can be really good at helping create use cases for different tools, different data sets that are incredibly valuable in our work together. And once you find a valuable use case and people understand that it's not always additional work, but sometimes it replaces work and sometimes it's actually much more productive. And that just moves virally throughout an organization, doesn't it? When you find something valuable, word spreads and say, hey, go do this and make it in an integrated way because it will help you get speed to insight faster and confidence faster. Yeah. And I'd also call out and say, look, our data team are also people who are not only highly regarded in their jurisdiction of data science, but actually they're people with really good kind of, you know, EQ and interaction skills. And so, you know, they get to interact a lot with our kind of management teams at senior levels. Our management teams enjoy that. I'm pretty sure our data team enjoys those kind of level of interactions because they can have a lot of responsibility and a lot of autonomy for actually doing real projects with real businesses. So again, you know, the data team themselves don't want to be seen in some ivory tower sitting off in a corner. They want to actually be interacting with the management teams live you know, on a regular basis. And, and we found, again, giving them the tools and the capability to do that means, again, they feel much more part of one holistic team, which certainly for us works well. I mean, Hugh, you see people right at the leading edge and, and I'm always paranoid that, you know, like what we're doing is like stuff that we should have been doing four or five years ago. And actually we're really missing out on really innovative kind of like new firms that are doing things very differently. Where do you see the next wave of innovation? Because in some respects, we're talking about things here that are current, but the leading firms were thinking about them three, four years ago. So where, where do you see as like the real innovation that's kind of going on in, in private equity or, or software, frankly? I think you're at the leading edge of the real innovation, Nick. There are a few firms that are taking seriously what you're doing, particularly in sourcing and using AI and algorithms to figure out where are the deals that I want to buy. And I want to build my own proactive pipeline of doing deals, whether companies are for sale or not. And in order to do that, you have to have a sense of focus. You have to know exactly what you're looking for and be able to create an algorithm that then goes and finds companies that fit that description. The venture capital world has been doing this for a few years now, but I think the buyout world has a lot to learn from that. And uh, you're clearly utilizing some of that technology. A few other firms are, not many. Um, I think the next step that we're seeing is more automation in the early stages of due diligence. Obviously, due diligence requires uh, expertise, insight, judgment, but getting a head start on speed to insight so you can underwrite more confidently what you're buying sooner is becoming more and more important. And I think we're going to see tools in the marketplace over the next 12 months that are going to allow for a much faster uh, 
initial set of due diligence um, information and due diligence analytics to get you to that insight, both utilizing uh, internal data on the part of a company, as well as third party data in and around the industry and understanding how things are being pulled together. So those tools are coming. Uh, we're building some of them, so I know they're coming with confidence. Uh, but I think the the whole sourcing and beginning of the diligence process is going to be transformed in the industry. It's going to be a next five year thing, but the beginnings of it are are already there. Really helpful, thank you. It's very exciting as well. Yeah, it is. Still, it's, it's still innovation. It's it's. I mean, I all the way along, I felt massively privileged. You've been in this industry that's been growing and and innovating, and I think, frankly, getting better in society as well you know like the buyouts of 20 years ago you know go in cut costs you know put leverage on etc i mean the industry is just fundamentally a better industry doing better things for businesses and for entrepreneurs now than it was so it's uh, it's great it still feels very stimulating doesn't it exactly right well nick i do want to thank you again for coming by today it's been obvious if you just look at the objective data that hg has been a successful wildly successful private equity firm and a pioneer for many, many years. But I think we now understand through the wisdom that you've brought us today, some of the underpinnings and some of the real reasons why HG has been able to be a pioneer and able to apply so many of the principles and lessons that you've outlined for the success of the business and the success of the, the industry. So thank you for that. Not at all, Hugh. We're, we're still in learning mode. <laughs> we're learning every day and, and we're enjoying that as well. We just keep learning and, and you know, try to take on board kind of wisdom from other people. That's how we, how we move ahead. So well, thank you for your time. If you don't want to miss future episodes of Dry Powder, subscribe today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you may listen. I'm Hugh MacArthur. Thank you for listening.